Hey, thanks so much, Scott. Um, welcome, everyone. Uh, well, so this is our October webinar series, uh, part of our October session. Uh, this is going to be slightly different. So it, the format's going to be a little different. You can tell by if you've been to the uh, Design Safe webinars this, this year, you'll notice the format's a bit different. We're using uh, a traditional Zoom instead of our webinar Zoom, uh, because this is also going to be partially a workshop. Uh, for those of you who've been with us since the very beginning, you notice that when we first started hosting these webinars, they were all about uh, the different aspects of Design Safe and the different technologies and how you can integrate that into your research and how powerful uh, Design Safe can be for you. And then we started talking about the different um, the, how the different researchers are using Design Safe in their research. Um, we had some sessions about the different features of Design Safe. Well, this is slightly different. This is a, a use case on how Design Safe is being used in the real world, plus a workshop that will guide you through some of that process. So um, my keyboard just died here. So anyways, we really, really appreciate your feedback. This is where some of these webinar ideas come from, is they come directly from you. Uh, feel free to scan this uh, QR code that will take you to our survey. So after this webinar and the workshop is complete, uh, please take the survey. Let us know how the webinar was, how the workshop was. If there are any ideas you'd like to uh, like to have a webinar on or any uh, topic that you think would be a great idea for a webinar, please contact us and let us know all about that. Uh, this is an iterative process, and we just want to be able to give you guys the best content available. So today, uh, we're going to be talking about interacting with next generation liquefaction uh, database. That's the NGL database using Jupyter Notebooks. So it'll be like a 40 minute webinar describing what the NGL project is all about. Uh, brief overview of the supported modeling team, the, the studies that were done, and the relational database and how the database is organized. Uh, the project is organized through the Pacific Earthquake Engineering Research Center and the Southwest Research Institute uh, with the principal investigators, Steve Kramer, uh, John's, I actually practice his name too, Somaticos and Jonathan Stewart, and uh, the NGL activities, which are currently supported by the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission and U.S. Bureau of Reclamation Peer, of course. So this webinar workshop is going to focus on the relational database, which was created and hosted on Design Safe and accessible through Jupyter. It's a publicly accessible community resource containing information about different sites, uh, the different events, observations, um, observations of liquefaction, whether they happen or not, a GUI uh, that allows you to interact with the database directly. Uh, and you can, of course, view and download the data sets as well. It's it facilitates very comprehensive workflows and it's replicated daily to design safe so users can interact with it uh, through MySQL queries using uh, Jupyter Notebooks. Uh, so we're hoping that this is gonna explain how to query the data. So this is the workshop side of it. Uh, we'll demonstrate a number of the tools available for you all to access and adapt uh, this technology into your own workflows and we'll be all then afterwards we'll have an 80 minute workshop in which you're all going to essentially get a hands-on introduction to using Jupyter notebooks and interact with the NGL data uh, so we're going to be covering the next generation liquefaction project the NGL project uh, some basic MySQL commands uh, using essentially how do you uh, set up these relational databases using foreign keys, using primary keys, uh, how to join the different tables together, and uh, using Jupyter Notebooks as your interface to the NGL data, uh, data. And then, of course, how to build these workflows. Our presenters are uh, Scott Brandenburg, who's a professor at the Department of Civil and, and Environmental Engineer at UCLA. He's also a co-PI on DesignSafe. Uh, I've known Scott for a long time. and this is something Scott's been really passionate about since I first introduced to him about introducing SQL databases into Design Safe. Uh, also joining us today is Dr. Kristen Ulmer. She's a research engineer at Southwest Research Institute here in uh, Texas, in San Antonio. And uh, Paralo uh, Zamaro, who's an assistant professor at the University of Calabria in Italy, uh, who's a visiting project scientist over at UCLA. So uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, welcome, Scott. Uh, welcome, Kristen, and welcome, Paulo. Uh, Kristen, I, I believe you're going to be up first. So uh, thanks so much. And I will chat with everybody after the webinar. I'm going to be handing off the screen to you. 
Perfect. Thank you. All right. Is that showing up okay? Yeah, it looks great. Okay, good. Thank you everyone for being here. Uh, I hope you can hear me okay. Um, I'm excited to be sharing some of this information with you. Uh, as Charlie said, um, Scott Powell and I are very excited to be talking about the NGL database today. And a quick outline of what we're gonna talk about. We'll go over the NGL project really briefly, some of the organizational structure of the project itself. And we'll, we'll also um, cover, that's when I'll hand it over to Paolo. He'll talk about the relational database structure. Hand it over to Scott. We'll talk about querying the NGL database and design safe, just sort of an overview of how to do that. But then after that 40 minute section, we'll give a nice long workshop where we can interactively work with you to write a Jupyter notebook. There we go. All right, so if you have heard of the Next Generation Liquefaction Project, you already know this, I hope, but uh, this project is advancing the state of the art in liquefaction research and working toward providing end users with a consensus approach to assess liquefaction potential within a probabilistic and risk informed framework. There are three ongoing components of this project that are happening right now simultaneously. Um, one of them is to develop a community database of liquefaction case histories, and that's what we're going to focus on today, but there are two others that you should know about. Uh, the second is uh, performing focused studies to fill knowledge gaps, so sort of extending the reach of the database since the database is, uh, is limited to what we've been able to see in the past and may not fill all of the parameter space that we're interested in filling. And then the third is to facilitate model development among multiple research groups who are interested in developing liquefaction models. <clears throat> This is a quick or, uh, overview of the organizational structure of NGL. Um, starting in the middle, we have a project management team. Um, so we have Jonathan Stewart, Steve Kramer, and John Stamatikos, who are all part of that management team. They work with the a joint management committee who um, has members of our key organizations there, which also works with our executive advisor, Professor Idris, and our advisory board, Professors Boulanger, Bray, and Kubernovsky. And then the three components that I mentioned earlier, the database development, focus studies, and model development all happening simultaneously under the direction of the project management team. Uh, the database development group discusses issues that are related to database management. They handle reviewing the case histories um, and help to populate the database where, um, they're, where we're covering legacy case histories that there aren't current users with new data to add. And our focus studies group, uh, we're focusing on a couple of different topics such as susceptibility, overburden, and initial shear stress effects, um, looking at laboratory studies for those. And then our model development um, pro um, prong, <laughs> our effort over here in model development. Um, there's no one single model development team, but there are multiple teams who are all on board to collaborate and use the NGL database to develop their models. That's sort of an overview of what NGL is working on right now. Today, as I said, we're gonna talk mostly about what the database development group has been up to and what we've produced so far. So what is in the NGL database? What have we been collecting? So if you go to our website, which I'll give the link for in a moment, you'll be able to see information about events, earthquake events, uh, such as where they occurred, the magnitude, when they occurred, things like that. And you'll also see information about sites. Um, in the NGL database, sites is somewhat a loose organizational term uh, just for structure to upload your information. I'm sure Paolo will talk about that in better detail later. But the idea is that there's a collection of information that's sort of under an umbrella of a site. And you'll see in situ tests. Um, so SBTs, CPTs, invasive and non-invasive geophysical tests. Where possible, we upload the original logs or the um, images that show plots of this information. But there's also, of course, the digital version of all of this information organized in different tables with the MySQL structure, which again, Paolo will talk about in more detail in a little bit. You'll also see information about observations of liquefaction or non-liquefaction. 
Uh, you'll see photos such as the one shown over here. Uh, you'll see text descriptions, um, check boxes for whether there was sand boils or settlement or lateral spread or uh, structural damage that was related to liquefaction. And you'll also see uh, information about the ground motion. So uh, ground motion intensity measures like PGA or areas intensity, other many other options that are in there for the ground motion intensity measure. Any information that we have on it, it's there. <clears throat> In addition to those, uh, there's also a component of the database that's dedicated to laboratory tests. This one is somewhat new and a little bit uh, is still evolving. You'll see most of the data in the database is currently related to um, field case histories of liquefaction or non-liquefaction. But there's a component that's focused on laboratory tests. This would include simple shear tests, track seal tests, uh, consolidation tests. In addition to all of your typical uh, grain size distribution, plasticity, relative density, other tests that you might uh, run to characterize the soil. Um, these laboratory tests uh, can be tied to a sample that was taken in the field that has an event and a site and in situ information, or it could be tied to a lab derived specimen that you got from a bag of sand you bought at the store. So uh, there's a lot that's going into the laboratory test component and uh, we're always interested in hearing about additions anyone might have. So feel free to contact us if you have laboratory test information or case histories that you could add to our database. By the numbers, the NGL database is quite large. Uh, we have hundreds of CPT soundings and boreholes, uh, many surface wave measurements and invasive VS profiles, though not as many as CPTs and SPTs. We have um, quite a few hundreds, in fact, of liquefaction observations and non-liquefaction observations. And these numbers are broken into four columns. The first column uh, is the total number of everything that's in the database. So that includes what's in the three other columns. So uh, information in the database can be in one of three developmental stages. So in preparation means that uh, a user has started to upload the information, but it's not ready for public release yet. So only the person uploading the information can see it. Under review means that the person who uploaded the information has submitted it to be reviewed by our database development group. And anybody can see it at that point publicly. Though you'll see in the graphical user interface in the GUI that there's a check for reviewed and an X for not reviewed yet so that you know whether it's been reviewed or not. And then the final stage of, of development in the, of data in the, in the database is uh, for something to be fully reviewed. So that means it's been reviewed by two separate members of the database development group. And the review process itself uh, is intended to make sure that the information is correct, there's no typos, uh, the information is complete, that uh, if you're trying to do a liquefaction assessment, there's a groundwater table, other things that you actually need to be able to, um, to evaluate liquefaction. And my note at the bottom of the screen shows the current database size is nearly one and a half gigs. That includes all of the uploaded images, the data that's in all the tables, everything. So it's grown quite a bit over the last uh, year and a half, two years. So this is a screenshot of our website the URL, nextgenerationliquefaction.org. You can go there and take a look at the data for yourself whenever you'd like. Um, we have some, uh, so you'll see the map at first when you pull it up. On the left, there are some filters you can apply if you're interested in seeing sites that have been reviewed or not reviewed, um, seeing sites where liquefaction was observed or where liquefaction was not observed. Um, you can see where there's CPT information or SPT or both or other types of in situ measurements. You can also filter out the size of the earthquake. You can even type in an event name and search for just that earthquake and see what's on the map. If you zoom in on one of these sites, for example, I zoomed in on one here uh, from the Loma Prieta event in 1989, you can click on individual markers to get some more information about what's there. For example, if you click on one of the SBT markers, you'll see information about the um, location, the type of test that was performed, uh, remarks about where the information came from, a checkbox to mean, or check mark to mean that it's been reviewed or an X if it hasn't been reviewed, 
and a green plot button so you can quickly visualize the SPT and stratigraphy information there. Uh, same story for a CPT marker. If you click on an icon for a CPT, you'll see um, information about the CPT, whether it's been reviewed or not, and you can plot it. If you click on an observation icon, you can see the checkboxes that were checked for the types of manifestations. So in this case, some surface evidence of liquefaction, including settlement and structural damage, and then a note about what they actually saw and where that information came from. As I said, if you click on the green plot buttons, you can visualize some of the CPT or SPT information and the stratigraphy. And this is all really helpful and nice for quick vis visualization. But as we'll talk about in our presentation today, there are a lot more sophisticated things you could visualize and a lot more uh, interactive ways you can, in, you can uh, work with the database using Jupyter Notebooks instead of what's provided in the GUI. So we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, one final plug for our uh, NGL YouTube channel. Uh, we periodically host webinars where we highlight interesting information in the database, uh, and we uh, and we post these to our NGL YouTube web uh, channel. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to Paolo. Um, Paolo, would you like to control the slideshow? share my screen here it is all right all right so thanks a lot uh for uh these uh initial presentation the the section of the slide deck i'm going to present is about the relational database what it is and how uh, we actually use the relational database features uh, in the NGL context. And this is something that will uh, work a little bit more uh, after the webinar when we go into uh, the details of what you can do using the NGL data. So first of all, what's a database? So um, the, the definition of a database that's been used in the hazards, uh, engineering hazards community uh, is not necessarily what um, what um, computer scientists have been doing. So example of collection of data, what we've been calling databases in the past are, you know, um, experimental data archived in design safe or other, um, uh, or other collection of data like the NGA projects. They were usually uh, developed at splat file or um, published as, as flat files. Those are collection of data. They are uh, not necessarily also relational databases. What a relational database is, is uh, it's something that has relationship between individual pieces of information that are then organized into tables. This is what the uh, science, uh, data science community calls a database and it's usually written in MySQL Microsoft Access uh, and so forth. And so what we are gonna talk about today is a relational database. NGL is structured as a relational database. So uh, it's a structured body of related information. Data is organized uh, based on uh, tables and the relationships between tables are described by a so-called schema and we looked into the NGL schema in a moment. So a schema allows you to map how tables are related one to another in a relational database. So we usually relate tables by means of keys. A primary key is a unique identifier for each record in each table. And uh, this cannot be repeated within the same table. So it's an identifier that identifies one specific record. A foreign key is a field in one table that identifies a record in another table. In other words, what it's a primary key in a table and it's then recalled in another table will be recalled as a foreign key. I'm gonna show you a little bit more how primary and foreign keys are related one to another in the next slide. And then of course, databases are typically accessed using uh, SQL, which is a, the structured query language which is the way to interact with the database. 
So an example flat file here is an example flat file about round motion. So maybe uh, some of you uh, are familiar with these kind of flat files. In this case, we have uh, two events, two earthquakes, the Westwood Hills and the Hollywood Valley earthquakes, each of which have a magnitude and epicentral latitude and longitude. These two events were recorded by two stations that happened to be the same for both earthquakes, the factory building and the Santa Monica courthouse station. Each station has specific information related to them. In this case, uh, the shear wave velocity, time average, shear wave velocity in the upper 30 meters, BS 30. And then there are pieces of information that are related to the intersection between the earthquake and the station. So when an earthquake is recorded by a certain station, it generates a distance between the epicenter, in this case, it is bore, general bore distance, so between the source and the station, and then the peak ground acceleration or any other intensity measure that is recorded for that event in that station. So if you look more carefully about the structure of this very flat file, you can recognize information pertaining to the earthquake, to the event, information about the stations, and information about the ground motion, which are then uh, kind of the intersection of the previous two, okay? So let's keep this color coding and these apple, orange, banana uh, kind of mapping tool to separate information into separate tables. Now, this is a relational database where we have three separate tables the event table where you have an event ID, which is the primary key in yellow, which is a unique identifier for each record. So the Westwood Hills earthquake is event ID number one. There is not gonna be any other event ID number one in this table. And then the Hollywood Valley is event ID number two. So that's the unique identifier. And each of these records will have their own magnitude, latitude, longitude, and so forth. Then we have a second uh, table, which is the stations table. In this case, we have two stations in this example uh, database, the factory building and the Santa Monica courthouse. So station ID number one identifies factory building uh, with a certain BS30 and uh, station ID number two is the Santa Monica courthouse. So again, we have primary keys identifying uniquely these uh, entities. Now let's put this information together and let's go and look at the motion table, which has the intersection between earthquakes and stations. So you have a primary key for any entry in this table. You'll always have a primary key in any table you look at. And so the primary key here is, you know, we have four primary keys, one, two, three, four. So let's look at one. Motion ID number one has event ID number one, station ID number one, which means this is the Westwood Hills earthquake recorded by the factor, factor building station. And so we don't copy paste again, the magnitude, the epicentral latitude and longitude, the BS30 for the station. No, we just reference the information in those, table, uh, in those tables in this one by means of foreign keys. And so the only new information is the distance and the peak ground acceleration. We do the same for any motion entries. So the, the second entry in the motion table will be event ID number one, station number two. So it's the Westwood Hills earthquake again. We don't repeat any of that information recorded by the Santa Monica Courthouse station. And then the new information is what's stored in the motion table, which is the distance and the PGA. So by doing these, we avoid problems with repetitions, with redundancy. We avoid the problem of new fields and the database is now uh, faster to access and better to use. Now, a flat file is a static entry, okay? So if you have to modify one entry pertaining to one specific aspect, you have to have, you know, to go through, uh, modify it and then recirculate the modified files. Uh, while a relational database is kind of dynamic, so if you, if you need to modify a single entry in a single table, you only modify that table and that gets 
uh, kind of uh, modified in real time in the server where the database is stored. Now, when you have a relational database, you may tell, you may tell me, Paolo, I wanna recreate a flat file with all of the information from the database. It's fairly easy to do that. We can query the database and recreate a flat file whenever we want. So a flat file is a static entity. A relational database has all of the flexibility I was talking about, but it can be also used to create a flat file. So for the event station motion database we were talking about, we can have a query where we recreate the flat file. Now the query is gonna be written in a way that is like that. Select is our command. And then we select all of the fields from all of the tables we wanna see in the flat file. In this case, the event name, magnitude, latitude, longitude, the station name, yes, 30, distance, kick round acceleration, okay? These are all of the fields you wanna see in that flat file. So you select all of those. And then you start from, in this case, the intersection table, the motion table. So you select all of that from the motion table and you inner join. So we'll talk more about these commands after the webinar is done in the workshop. For now, I would like to kind of stimulate your curiosity about queries, about what you can do uh, with such tools. So you join the motion table with the station table, where? where the station ID primary key is the same ID as the station ID foreign key in the motion table. And then we do the same. So we are joining the motion table with the event table where the event ID primary key in the event table is equal to the event ID foreign key in the motion table. By doing that, we recreate our flat file. Now this is, a relatively simple query that I hope illustrates how easy it is to recreate a flat file from a data from a relational database and shows you how flexible and nice it is to work on a database. More on queries, and we'll start from scratch in the workshop later. So um, here I'm showing you uh, a snapshot of what a schema can look like. And in this case, uh, we have site investigation tables for the next generation liquefaction database. So we start from the site, then we have a field test, uh, the site ID is a foreign key in the test table, and then we have a bunch of different uh, tables using a test ID as a foreign key for CTT, boreholes, surface wave test, the water table, and so forth. And then we have you know data tables that are kind of down the road. So uh, all of these is what's reported, reported in a schema. And the schema for the NGL database is actually available online. Here is the address. You can click on the www.nextgenerationliquidaction.org website. Then you click on interact with data. You click on schema and you'll see that you have information about any single table and any single entry in the NGL database. So database. So when you need to write a query and you don't remember exactly how two tables are related one to another or things like that, then you can go and look at the schema and then you know what the, not, what the name of the columns are and how tables are related one to another. And of course, we'll talk about more about these when we go into the query stuff in the workshop, okay? So this was my last slide. Um, now, uh, Professor Brandenburg is gonna take from that. All right, thanks, Paolo. Trying to get in presentation mode here. All right, one point that I'll, I'll clarify that is the, the more recent NGA projects, including NGA subduction, have actually also moved toward a relational database format and can produce a flat file in the way that Paolo was was just mentioning. So we didn't want to imply that uh, NGA is, is you know, documenting everything in flat file form. Sylvia Mazzoni has done a great job with those databases. So I'm gonna talk about querying the uh, NGL database using Jupyter, which is really the purpose of today's workshop. Um, and you'll, you'll do some of this if you participate in the workshop um, in the next, you know, after I talk for 10 minutes or so here. Um, 
So what what motivated us to um, to coordinate with DesignSafe on this NGL project is that we have an interface that's developed using HTML and PHP, uh, JavaScript, and kind of traditional web development tools. And it allows users to upload data to it. So any of you can contribute data. In fact, I would encourage you to do it if you have data that you would like to share that's relevant for liquefaction. That would be great. It's intended to really be a community resource. Um, Users can also download the data. So um, if you go to the NGL website and you push a download button, what happens on the back end is that some queries are written like the ones that Paolo showed, and it produces a comma separated value file that contains the information that you requested. So you can download data through our interface that way. Um, as Kristen mentioned, it's up to about 1.4 gigabytes. So it's, you know, that's not a big database by any stretch of the imagination by computer science standards, but you know it's big for users who may want to try and download everything into Excel. You know that's not really going to work anymore. But you could download a whole bunch of different files and work with it that way. Uh, we also have some visualization capability. Kristen showed some of that, so you can view cone penetration tests, you can view boring logs, um, any even the images that show you know photos of uh, evidence and stuff like that. But users can't further interact with data on our server. So if you wanted to do something like calculate uh, an integrated property from a cone penetration test, like uh, liquefaction potential index or liquefaction severity number or some of these other indices, you're not going to be able to do that on our server. You'll have to, you know, you would have to download the data and do it on your own computer. And we really we wanted to facilitate those kind of workflows directly with the data. So what we've done is set up a replication of the entire NGL database to design safe and that replication script runs every day. Um, that's beneficial for us for two reasons. One is that users can now query the replicated version of the database on design safe and build their own workflows. And then the other one is that it creates a nice backup for us. So in case uh, we're hacked and there's some kind of problem, we've, we've got this nice backup on design safe, which is very secure. So the way that users can interact with the database is to write their own SQL queries. So you know that, that's what we'll focus a lot of attention on today. And um, we, you can do that using Jupyter notebooks that are written you know, in, the, in the Python language in this case. Um, we've published a number of Jupyter notebooks that are accessible through hazard apps in the workspace. And we also have some documentation of those, which I'll show here in just a second. So if you go to Design Safe and click on uh, the um, Tools and Applications page under Workspace, you'll see a Next Generation Liquefaction button there. And if you click that button, it will take you to a location that has a list of Jupyter Notebooks that you can open and um, interact with data there. Those notebooks are all read-only um, because we don't want users to be able to directly edit the official version, but you're welcome to also replicate those notebooks and store them in your own file space on design safe and then it would not be read only anymore you can modify it and build on it if you want to so um, we also have some documentation so if you go to the uh, next generation liquefaction.org webpage under interact with data that's where you'll find the schema you can um, find the, the this existing design safe user button will take you directly to that um, the, the, the Jupyter Notebook, same place as if you went through the workspace and clicked on that button. You can create a new account. Hopefully all of you have an account if you plan on uh, participating in the workshop. And you can click this NGL Tools documentation button. And uh, this is what it looks like. And I think I'm gonna leave the presentation now and go do a live demo. So let me uh, come over to here. All right, live demos are always risky, but today's a workshop, so it's kind of all about live demos. We figured it better work or else the whole thing is gonna not work so great. So if I click here on NGL Tools documentation, it takes me to this uh, read the docs page. So <clears throat> we have all of our documentation written up in GitHub. And as we develop a new a use case or basically like a bare bones tool that we think would provide a good building block for users to adapt into their own workflows. We document them here. And so you're welcome to come here and take a look at what we've done. 
And there's kind of a various levels of complexity in what we're doing here. So there's a little description of what we're, you know, what this is all about, and then some background information. So, you know, for example, here's a Python, here's two lines of Python code that allow you to connect to the database in Design Safe. Now, one thing, this import NGLDB script, that's only going to work in Jupyter in Design Safe. So if you want to connect to the database, you have to be in Jupyter in Design Safe and not locally on your own computer because the, the database is also in Design Safe. So there, it, you know, there has to be a shared server for that connection. Um, then you know, we do have some published notebooks that are cited here. They have uh, digital object identifiers. Um, Paolo talked about the schema. So here's a link to the schema. That's, that's a really important thing during the workshop. We'll bounce back and forth between the schema and uh, Jupyter because I have a hard time remembering sometimes exactly what we named a table or a field. And I have to go look at it and figure out, oh, that's the foreign key that I need. So it's important to know where this is and have it handy. And then we'll, we'll replicate uh, some of these example queries today. So um, here's an example. Uh, we're, we're using pandas, which is a sort of a data management package in, um, in Python. Um, you put data into data frames and you can use pandas to perform um, SQL queries, which is how we'll do it. There are other ways of doing queries as well. And then we import NGLDB, which is the package that creates the database connection script. In this line, we're creating the connection. And then here is like one of the most basic SQL queries that you could ever have, select star from site. So we're just saying get everything from the site table and put it in. And then this one is putting it into a data frame called DF. So read SQL and we put in the, the SQL string and the connection, and then it gives us a data frame. And that data frame is printed here. And you may have noticed there's a link here. So uh, I'm gonna open that in a new tab. Although this is one of the problems that Zoom window is always right on top of our tabs. So I can't access them. There we go. So if you click on that, it takes you directly to the um, Design Safe notebook. And you can, you can just click run on each of these cells and then it will run the uh, the script that we just had, and it may look different now. We're constantly adding information in. So at the time we wrote the documentation, there may have been fewer um, sites than there are now. I, I don't actually know if that's true. There's seven, let's see, the highest site ID is 725. And if we go back here, it was 682, right? So we have added some information since developing the documentation. Okay, and then we go on to a little more complicated query where we're getting data from a famous liquefaction site, the Wildlife Liquefaction Array down in the Imperial Valley where I grew up. So I may be biased toward the site since it's uh, close to where I'm from. Um, and here's a kind of a description of some of the fields and the tables that we're using. And now this is a, a much more complicated query, right? It's, it's pulling data from multiple tables and we're having to use multiple interjoined statements like what Paolo showed. So we're getting the event, magnitude, name, year, latitude, longitude, and then, um, oh, FLDM is a field observation at a point. It's either a field observation that, that liquefaction surface evidence was observed here or was not observed here. And it may also contain information about like whether the ground motion, if there's a co-located accelerometer has indications of liquefaction due to a change in frequency content. And then we're getting, um, so, you know, the latitude, longitude of these field observations, uh, surface evidence, SFEV is whether or not surface evidence was observed. And it's either, it's a Boolean field, it's either one or zero. One means that surface evidence was observed, zero means it was not. Um, zero does not mean that we don't know, right? There's a difference between gathering evidence that liquefaction did not occur that's evidence of lack of liquefaction. That's different than a lack of evidence, right? That would be if nobody went to look. So if there's a lack of evidence, we don't include it in the database. It, it has to be a yes or a no that there is surface evidence or there's not surface evidence. And then a description. And then these are the inner join statements that kind of synthesize this together. And then there's a where statement at the end. So Paolo's query created the entire flat file I just wanted it for the wildlife array. So I put site name equals wildlife array. And then you can see we have four observations here. 
from uh, different earthquakes, right? One in 1981, two in 87, and then the El Mayor Kukapa earthquake in 2010. And um, two of the events produced surface evidence and two of them didn't. So you can quickly see that. And then here's one where we're getting out some cone penetration test data. I think I'll push this off for the workshop because that's kind of what we'll work on today. This is a, kind of a close example of what you'll do. Uh, and then I, I wanted to move on and show some more complicated um, notebooks. So here's one that's a cone penetration test viewer. And this, this one is kind of beyond what we'll cover today. It involves um, creating drop-down menus so that you can pick sites and tests and things like that. But it's there for you. If you want to do something like this as part of a workflow to do your science on liquefaction, you know, this is an example that you can follow. So here's a drop-down. This is using the IPy widgets package in Python. So you can come and pick a particular site here. Um, you know, there's a lot of sites that have, I think this is a list of sites that have cone penetration tests. So it's not all of the sites, um, but we'll pick one like Miller Farm. And then we can pick, you know, Miller Farm has all these different cone tests and these are their names. So we can pick like CMF001. And here you can see it has cone tip resistance, sleeve friction, and the pore pressure measurements blank. That just means that the pore pressure was not measured for this one. Um, I thought that there were some at this site that had it, but anyway, some sites don't have it. And then there's also some metadata down here that's, uh, that's presented. So you can see the kind of rig that it is, um, where the pore pressure measurement is located. By default, we assume it's U2, but sometimes they specify other locations, the area, the push rate, and, and so forth. All right, so I'm gonna go back to my presentation. Okay, and um, I guess at this point we can we can open it up for questions, and I see that there are probably some in the chat. And I guess what I would encourage you to do is if you have if you have questions that are very specific to how to write queries in Jupyter, maybe it's better to wait for the workshop because we're going to go into breakout rooms and uh, you can ask those questions there. But if you have questions about the NGL project or something that's that's maybe unrelated to writing queries, feel free to ask it now. And you can put it in the chat, or I think you could also unmute yourself if you want to and uh, ask it um, out loud. So Kristen, have you, you've been kind of answering some questions here. Are there unresolved questions in the chat? I'm looking right now. I think we've got them. Um, I'll just say that the one of the most recent questions that I asked, answered was about um, acceleration time histories. So um, Paula, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but the NGL database doesn't have the time acceleration, sorry, the time histories stored. NGA has those, right? But there is an IM table in the NGL database that helps you link up um, uh, where, where you might want to look for the information in NGA. <laughs> so. And then, yeah, Aditya has a good question too. I might not be able to attend the workshop due to other commitments. Is there a GitHub associated with the workshop part? And uh, yeah, Charlie confirmed, we'll put it in the community data folder and then we'll add the documents, we'll add it to that documentation page. So you'll be able to find the, uh, the workshop material that we develop. And we're not gonna record the workshop part, um, but what we'll do is a short video that's a walkthrough of the notebook that we end up developing today. Okay, so let me provide a few logistics about how the workshop is gonna proceed. Uh, we will go into breakout rooms and um, I'm gonna set those up here in just a second. So I'll have to stop my share in just a second to do that.